Good morning. It's great to be here. I, you know, I, I hope I don't disappoint after that glowing introduction, but um, yeah, it's, it's quite a thing to wake up one morning and find your Twitter feed getting blown up by people saying, isn't that your book on President Xi's uh, uh, shelf? Um, so that's pretty cool. But um, as, as a futurist, one of the things that you try and do is you're not just looking at what's going to happen in the future. You have to look at analogies for what might happen based on what's happened in the past. JP and I were talking about this last night. A futurist told him once, you have to be a good pastus, you know, understanding the past to understand the future. And when you look at what's happening in financial services broadly, when we look at isolation, isolated technologies like blockchain or the smartphone, for example, we might think of these as you know, a, a data solution for the bank. Or we might think of mobile like a channel for the bank. But if you step back from those specific technologies and you look at what's happening in the world, something is changing. The world is digitizing. And the world is digitizing because we're seeking low friction and immediacy. We want immediate responses. We want um, um, you know, stronger uh, uh, commerce connections that can scale up more rapidly. These are the systems that are changing globally. So within that framework, you can't expect banking and financial services to stay the same as it has been, because ultimately it has to shift. So when we look at these phases of development of banking, if you overlay technology on this, you understand that it's not just about inserting technology into banking, there's a larger shift here. Part of the shift is around trust and the utility of the bank. So when we look at the Bank 1.0 world, the foundational elements of banking, going back to the time of Medici's and uh, Florence and uh, Firenze and places like that. When, when you look at that, banking was very simple. You would go to the bank and we trusted the bank because that was the safe place to store the money. But transactionally, as our demands on the banking system increased, we needed to put technology in place to keep up with the demands of utility. This is the first bank mainframe called IRMA, Electronic Recording Machine for Accounting. Uh, this is, I think, where acronyms were introduced into banking through technology. This was built by MIT for Bank of America in 1953, and it was primarily designed to do check processing back then. So technology started to change the banking sector. Now, you probably don't know this, but prior to the introduction of Irma and mainframes, we never had bank account numbers. You'd go to a bank, and they would fill out a card, and they'd put your name on it, and that was your account record and your customer record. Your name and address was on a physical card in a bank branch. And this was why for 30 years after this, some banks, you couldn't actually move from one branch to another without opening another account because they stored your bank account details on this little card. But Irma couldn't sort customer information by name. And so they had to give each customer and each account a unique number to sort it in the computer system. The computers weren't very sophisticated back then. This was the first use of bank account numbers due to the mainframe. Then in the mid-80s, we started to look at ways to extend the platform of banking and make it self-service. We had the internet come along in the 90s, but this really started with the introduction of the ATM machine, self-service banking. Now, what's happening is we're trying to say we're extending the bank as a platform, but our reliance on the bank as a building, the bank as a place, was becoming less and less important because now we're saying you can bank 24-7. And then when Bank 3.0 came along, we extended that analogy to say you could bank anywhere, anytime. And this mobile, if, if you step back from this and say, well, you know, this was just another channel to extend banking, then you don't understand the implications here. Because what it was doing was saying, banking can be done wherever you are. You don't need the bank. But what was key was the core utility of the bank was being surfaced through this technology. And so the trust was changing from being about a place you could go where your money was safe to now a set of 
bank platform technologies that would enable you to do banking. Today, it's not a bank charter that makes someone trust in you as a bank brand, it's the utility of your bank. If your technology stops working for 10 days, you can't access internet banking, the point of sale systems are down, the branch systems aren't working, how much trust do you think people would have in your bank for those 10 days? So utility and trust become wrapped up and technology now becomes the overarching mechanism for delivery of that utility. But something else changed. We started to see us rethinking the way financial services should work. This is Yue Bao, the most successful investment or savings product on the planet today. Built in China on top of Alibaba's system to capture those deposits from merchants and consumers working on Alibaba and Taobao, putting that aside and giving them some high yield interest rate. We classify this in the West as a money market fund. Jack Ma doesn't see it as that. They, that's why they called it UA Bao, hidden treasures. They saw it as a behavioral model for savings. $180 billion assets under management. No branches, no humans involved in the sale of that product. Now, in the past, you may have heard an argument that we need bank branches or we need face-to-face -face interaction because how else are we going to engage customers to take deposits, to take assets? And yet the most successful deposit product in the world today doesn't involve humans. It's completely automated. And Alipay, Ant Financial, the parent company of Alipay in China, has a higher trust rating in China than most of the banks there. Why? It could be argued it's because of utility. Now, when you see where we're going with this, the next generation of technologies we're talking about, uh, voice-based artificial intelligence, personal smart assistance built into our home and into our telephone, augmented reality smart glasses in a few years that can give you field of da data in your field of view so you can make decisions. These technologies will increasingly embed banking in our world. And so the design of a banking system to fit into this world requires us to sort of rethink banking from the ground up around utility, not around the products or the channels we're using. Now, when you look for evidence of changes in the way economics works and so forth, and you look at technology the way it's impacted, the biggest changes historically that have taken place in the world have happened with what we call first principles design thinking. That's when a new piece of technology comes along that's so different from the way it was done before, that it requires everyone to reset their thinking and change the way they behave. So the automobile was an example of that. It, it changed, uh, it, it got rid of all these people working in London and New York who were shoveling uh, the, uh, the horse uh, dung off the streets. It, it changed employment patterns. It changed the architecture of cities. This, it, it created the middle class in the United States. Uh, uh, you know, the, the Model T Ford production line is credited with creating the middle class in the United States. All of this from a first principles rethink about transportation. We don't need a faster horse. We need to rethink the way we get from point A to point B. And you can think of other examples of this as well. A great example of this is the iPhone. Now, when Steve Jobs worked on the iPhone and the iPod, you can see this is an example of the prototype that they used for creating the first iPhone and the first iPods. Now, Jobs didn't take the Nokia banana phone or the Motorola Flip or the Blackberry Rim and try and iterate on that. He said, if we're going to take a touchscreen device, a mobile phone, internet access, software apps, and combine them into a device, how would that work? This is what we call first principles thinking. Now, let me give you one other example of that, and then I'll tie this back to banking. Let's talk about uh, the development of technology here in Germany, the V2 rocket. Now, the V2 rocket was an amazing piece of technology. If you step away from what it was used for, it was decades ahead of the rest of the world in terms of technology development. 
But Werner von Braun, who was behind this technology, said he wanted to get men to the moon. So at the end of the Second World War, um, when the war was ending, the Russians, Americans, and the British were rushing into Germany to try and get access to these resources, and namely Werner von Braun. So he went on to build the Apollo program. Now, using this technology, he iterated on the V2, created the Mercury Redstone rocket, then the Apollo rocket, and at the height of this program, the average launch would cost about $1.2 billion in today's terms, about $6,000 to get a kilogram of stuff into orbit. And over the last 50, 60 years, we've reduced that by about a third by iterating on the Apollo design. But something interesting happened the last few years. Along came Elon Musk and SpaceX. And they said, if, what if happens if we were going to redesign rockets today? What if we started from scratch? What if we didn't take the Werner von Braun Apollo program design and iterate on this? What if we started from scratch using 3D printing of titanium engine parts? What if we started with new computer models, with new systems? If we started from scratch, would this make a difference? First principles thinking. And the result is that in just 14 years, with reusability on the Falcon um, Heavy platform, SpaceX has got the cost to orbit down to about $300 per kilogram, a 95% reduction of the days of the Apollo program. And they sent Starman into space in a Tesla. So this required rethinking the way rockets worked. Reusability, all of these things were uh, essential components of this. So you end up with two competing design themes in terms of how we incorporate technology into the world. You have first principles thinking, which says we've had a major leap in technology, it changes everything. Or the other approach, which is we take technology and we gradually improve on it. And that's what's happened in banking to date. We've taken technologies like the mainframe, the ATM machine, internet, mobile, and we've iterated on the traditional banking model. Branch banking, you know, investment advisors. We've iterated on this. So when the iPhone came along, instead of saying there's an opportunity to completely rethink the way financial services fits in people's lives, we took the primary artifact, a bank account, and we stuck a representation of that in the phone. This is what we call design by analogy. So these are the two competing design schools. Design, first principles design, start from scratch, or iterate on the existing model by incorporating technology. Now remember, t historically speaking, the biggest leaps and the biggest changes in the world have occurred through first principles thinking. So how would you think about acquisition of customers in the first principle world? Well, we'll introduce Jack Ma. Hear what he had to say about competing with Walmart. Now, it doesn't matter that he's talking about the retail business there because he's used the same strategy in financial services in China today, making him one of the fastest growing financial services organizations or Ant Financial, one of the fastest in the world growing. And hear what he said about competing with Walmart. He said he's going to be big, Alibaba's going to be bigger than Walmart in a couple of years because of this reason. You know, you did a great job, and blah, blah, blah. So we, I said, uh, maybe in 10 years, we'll be bigger than Walmart. He said, young man, you have a good hope. <laughs> <laughs> so we said, I'm going to make a map, bet. I yeah. think in 10 years, we'll be bigger than Walmart on the sales. Because if you want to have 10,000 new customers, you have to build a new warehouse and this, that. For me, two servers. Two computers. That's all he says he needs to get 10,000 customers, two, two servers, two computers. So in the world that Jack Ma thinks of financial services being embedded in people's lives, the ultimate low friction financial services engagement means that you can execute everything you need to across digital channels. Whereas with banks, we iterate on this. And we say, well, hang on, we don't want to sell stuff on the internet because that's going to cannibalize our existing agency business or our branch-based business. So let's put some transactional stuff online. And so when the internet came, came along, we didn't sell investment products or bank accounts on the internet. We created internet banking, which was essentially the bank statement online behind a login. And then mobile came along and we said, great, now we can put those bank statements on a smaller screen. This is the iterative thinking. 
So what you have today is compared with first principles players in this ecosystem, all of the challenger banks of the world and the new you know, um, you know, behavioral investment platforms and so forth are all about digital onboarding. And yet less than 5% of the banks in the world today offer complete digital onboarding of customers. So we're already starting to see the world diverge around this very simple engagement principle, how you acquire customers in the digital age. So if you're going to design value stores, you have to understand that technology is going to change the nature of banking itself. And that would have to start with the basic bank account or a value store. In fact, if you think about it, if you sort of break down the value financial service players provide to their customers, extending on what JP was talking about before, we probably only have three core products. We have the ability to store value, we have the ability to move money, and we have the ability to access credit. They're the core foundation elements or utility that our products that we give to customers provide. So then let's step back from the technology and think about the change that's occurring in terms of the value store itself at the heart of banking and financial services. If you look historically at the value stores we used to use, they weren't particularly smart. They would store our money safely. And at the time, that was what the core value proposition, the trust in a bank was for, because your money was safe. But as technology started to come into play, we took those dumb artifacts and we put them inside our technology platform to try and give some bigger utility. But they were still essentially dumb. They didn't provide any feedback. That basic debit card or credit card you use when you go to visit a, uh, a store, it doesn't even tell you a balance before and after the transaction. That's the most requested piece of information you get from customers about their day-to-day -day bank account. So we had to think about this in a different way. So when it comes to what we're seeing in terms of investment today, what's happening is you're not getting people just look at digital onboarding. You're seeing from the perspective of investment and savings, looking at behavioral mechanisms behind savings and investing. And not saying you need a minimum AUM to qualify as a customer to get into this account. Just saying, let's change your behavior so you can save. Let's change the way you save so you can invest more money. Because this, over time, builds AUM faster than saying, here's a great product to stick your money in. So this is the change. It's a behavioral framework around the value store, not a product framework. So when you look at how this might uh, evolve, a great illustration of this is happening in China right now with ICBC, with their AI investment platform. Now, what they do is they monitor your behavior in terms of your portfolio to produce a very detailed risk model. They've eliminated the risk profile questionnaire as part of the investment process. Now, from a perspective of a regulator, you might say, well, this is, this is a problem because we need that risk profile questionnaire to understand your risk profile and then understand that you've committed to that risk contained in that investment product. But that's iterative thinking. First principles design thinking is, well, let's monitor your behavior and learn how risky you are. And if that risk is a problem for you, let's change your behavior over time by educating you, by giving you the right behavioral triggers. So this is really at the heart of this change around financial services. As we get smarter, Banking and investment and these tools are becoming embedded in the world around us through technologies. And this is leading us to move away from the financial products we used to have to understanding that the utility of financial institutions is now surfaced not through products through a channel, but through technology experiences that surface the utility. The core ability to move money, store value, or access credit. So how we adapted to this in the past is we took those traditional interactions we'd had in the physical space and we implemented electronic forms or electronic systems to mimic the processes we'd had in the branch or with the investment advisor. We iterated on this from a technology perspective. Now I'm going to show you um, how Capital One did this with Alexa 
in respect to their credit card product. I know it's not a core product, but it's a good illustration of iteration. So voice is the next big technology that's going to affect financial services. So this is how one of the first banks in the world attacked the use of Amazon Alexa with voice. The Capital One skill for Amazon Alexa makes credit card payments easier than ever. After saying Alexa, open Capital One, and speaking your personal key, you can pay your bill using only your voice. When's my payment due? The payment of your credit card is due July 9. Pay my Capital One credit card bill. You'll get the option to pay your statement balance or a minimum payment. Make your choice and confirm. A confirmation code will appear on the Capital One skill card in your Alexa app once the payment has been made. Confirm. All set. I've made the payment for you. The Capital One skill makes account management as easy as speaking up. Just ask Alexa to find out for yourself. Now, this is not bad for a first attempt at adapting Alexa, but what they did is they just took the product they'd had in the branch, the credit card, and said, how do we put this on the voice channel? Whereas a first principles designer would say, you don't need plastic at all to make a payment. You've got your voice. That's your unique identifier. As long as you can attach that voice to a value store, you don't need plastic. You don't need a 16-digit number. You, you can get access to credit, but that can be based on an experiential basis rather than a physical card. That's first principles thinking versus iterative thinking. So when you look for evidence of first principles design in the financial services world, you see a lot of this coming out of China and these new fintech startups around the world. This is, of course, Tencent WeChat. Now, in China, 98% of mobile payments go through two technology platforms, Ant Financial's Alipay and Tencent WeChat, not through the traditional banks or traditional payments networks. And this has happened in the space of just a few years. Last year, $12 trillion in mobile payments. What that means is this year, China's mobile payments transaction traffic will surpass all of the card traffic of the world. There'll be more mobile payments globally done this year than all the plastic card payments done across uh, traditional means. This is a pretty big shift. But WeChat, they didn't try to create a credit card or debit card that you signed up for at a branch and you use a traditional point of sale network, they just used a simple QR code. First principles thinking around payments. It wasn't a payment product, it was enabling the utility of a payment experience. When Uber was faced with the challenges of growth in you know, American cities, in cities like New York and San Francisco and Chicago and Los Angeles, they couldn't recruit drivers fast enough. And they found out that 30% of the drivers who started the application process in the app got to a single field in the app and abandoned the driver sign-up process. And that field was the debit card because these were drivers who'd driven yellow taxi cabs and had never had a bank account. They'd been paid in cash. So to enable them to grow Uber faster, they had to issue drivers with a bank account. Overnight, Uber became one of the third largest acquirers of small business bank accounts in the United States. But Uber doesn't want to be a bank. They needed the utility of the bank built into their app to continue to grow their business. As JP mentioned, I found a move-in in 2011 in the US, and we've built essentially this app, this is the latest iteration of our app, as a smart bank account that will advise you on how to be financially healthy. And that includes investment products, includes savings behavior, and so forth. When we introduced our first savings experience in Move-in, which was in Q4 last year, 40% of our customers immediately deposited funds into the Move-in savings stash, as we call it, our savings account or value store. But we did zero marketing, and we have 0% APR on that savings account. 40% of our customers immediately overnight responded to that. We can tell you the best day of the week to prompt people to save. We can tell you the exact time of day when is the best time to message someone to save money. Behaviorally, we created a behavioral savings process not a savings account. Customer doesn't even need to sign up for a savings account with Move-In. We just enable their savings behavior. So when you start thinking about utility as it changes, banking becomes highly contextual. 
And a great example of this might be credit access for day-to-day -day banking, where I walk into a grocery store, and I fill up my cart, and I fill it up, and I go to the checkout, and then they swipe my card, and the cashier says, I'm sorry, sir, it's been declined. Yeah, some of your customers may have had this problem. And so then you go fishing for another card. Well, let me give you this one. Can you try this one? What about if we didn't think about that as a product-based process? What about if you think when you walk in the grocery store, if I know you don't have enough money to do your grocery shopping, I present you with an offer for credit access right there and then to solve that problem. I don't wait for you to get to the checkout. This is experiential design of this. So then we come back to the role of advisors. Because when it comes to financial services, we've had this view predicated over the last 30 or 40 years that the best way to get the best bang for your buck in investment terms is you need to have a human involved. You need to, to get that advice. But technology is also going to change the way we think of advice in financial services. In fact, probably the most common form of advice our customers will be faced with in the future from financial services is just something as simple as this. Hey, Siri, can I afford to go out for dinner tonight? And your bank account should be smart enough to answer that question. And if you're looking at retirement, how much do I need to save each week to put my son through college? How much do I need to put away for retirement? You know, these are questions a smart bank account should just be able to know, should just be able to answer for you. And artificial intelligence is going to give us that platform. Let me explain it in this uh, sort of context. We talked about autonomous vehicles, smart driving cars, and so forth. So this is what we think of when you, know, you think of how an autonomous vehicle drives. It learns by capturing all of this information using LiDAR, radar detection, um, for, you know, camera suites, and so forth. And all of this information captures about a 1,000 times the content visually that we could see through our human eye. And these chips now are so good at processing this that it could process that amount of information in about half the time of our brain, our neocortex or visual cortex can process. So a thousand times the information processed in half the time of a human brain. Ultimately, when this technology is mature, that's why no human will be able to keep up with an AI when it comes to driving. Same analogy in financial services, is the more data we have, the better advice we can give you, and no human will be able to process the same amount of data as an artificial intelligence. So when we look at this being applied in the robo space for robo-advising, 2017 was a big year. It was the first year that robo-advisors met the performance of human advisors in terms of portfolio returns. The best uh, robo-advisors getting about 11 to 12% return on the portfolios. So we're now starting to see the fact that in terms of the black box portion of this, that machines are catching up with humans. On the trading side, it's even worse. Goldman Sachs has said one programmer can replace five traders today by uh, application of technology. This was UBS's trading floor in Stamford back in the early 2000s in Stamford, Connecticut. Today, this is empty, this trading floor, because of the application of artificial intelligence. So AI is being introduced into the asset management side, portfolio management, advice, and uh, you know, return generation for assets under management. But aren't AI is all going to be the same? Well, let me use these two race cars as an illustration of this. These are Audi's test vehicles for their self-driving rig. They're not um, self-driving cars you drive on the roads. They're actually uh, racing cars. Now, there's two of these vehicles, test vehicle A and test vehicle B. The engineering team nicknamed them AJ and Bobby, A and B, right? But Bobby drives faster than AJ. Same car, same platform, same hardware, same firmware, same software, same engineers that drive this, and yet one of these cars drives faster than the other consistently. So I asked the engineers at Audi when I was doing Augmented, why is that? Why does one AI drive faster than the other? And the engineer from Audi said, hmm, 
you know, we, we really don't know. <laughs> I said, can you give a guess? And he said, well, actually, we think we know. One of the engineers early on in the process because this is a machine learning platform, maybe he drived a little bit more aggressively that day. Maybe he had an argument with his wife or got caught in traffic on the way to work. But that set a new baseline for one of the artificial intelligences to learn differently from its compa compatriot. And this shows us that even in investment, artificial intelligence one AI will differentiate from another AI in terms of some types of investment platform. For now, the advantage lies with advisory firms incorporating artificial intelligence. So it's man with machine versus man without machine. But it won't be long before it'll be machine versus man. We've got probably three to five years window where uh, we, we can supplement or augment human advisors with artificial intelligence. After that, AIs are going to start to separate themselves in terms of capability. So when you look at the problem of customer acquisition and relationship and engagement of customers, what becomes clear is one of our biggest problems in financial services is the way we identify customers. KYC. Kill your customers with paperwork.